Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I'm just so excited um, as we continue this series. I think for me, the series has been really powerful for me as I've just been doing a lot of research trying to understand this God that we serve. I think, you know, we can go through life, maybe we've been believers for a long time, maybe we're brand new, but we can never stop learning about him. There's so much about him and there's so many things that are so powerful that sometimes we have, we don't even understood yet. So I really want to encourage you, like always be spending time with Jesus, always be spending time in the word, always be spending time learning about him, because I don't think we can ever run out of things to learn. And so I've been really enjoying this. And I think in, for, for in our lives right now, I think all of us, if we can think about it, there's an area in our life that we really need courage in right now. And I look at my life, there's so many things that I look at, man, I need courage to keep going or I need courage to step out in faith or I need courage to overcome. I think all of us have things in our lives that we desperately need the courage to continue going in. We all have things in our life that we need to do and courage is something that's promised throughout scripture. If you read throughout scripture, we see moment after moment and story after story of people, ordinary people like you and I, stepping into a moment where courage comes and they actually have the ability to overcome and actually step out and do the things that God has called them to do, to actually do some things that are extraordinary and bring the miraculous. And we can have the same power, the same courage that God brought to them. I truly believe that God can bring to each and every one of us in the midst of whatever we're going through, whatever struggle, whatever pain, whatever situation, whatever addiction, whatever it is, I believe that God can give us the courage to overcome, and I believe that he can do that today. And so we're going to spend some time talking about courage today. We're going to be learning about courage today. I hope that you know, something that, that, that we talk about today can, can encourage you and help you on your journey with Jesus, that something that we talk about today can actually help you when it comes to life. And so today we're going to be talking about David. You know, and David is such a, you know, probably one of the most famous stories throughout Scripture because you see, you know, David and Goliath, you see this kind of, this analogy or this thought coming out all over the world, like David versus Goliath, you see this in sports culture, when like an underdog team beats the team that should win, and you right now, if any of you guys are basketball fans, right now is March Madness, college basketball, most of you probably don't even, maybe don't even know what I'm talking about, but college basketball, March Madness is this incredible tournament that happens for college basketball players, and every year they call it March Madness because you have teams that shouldn't win are beating teams that are supposed to win the championship, and because they play one game and this team overcomes, we see this, this kind of metaphor, this thought, David and Goliath come out throughout the world, and so we all know about David and Goliath when an underdog comes up and defeats something more powerful, bigger than they are. And I think all of us, you know, we maybe have things in our life that we are in the midst of trying to overcome, things in our life that we are in the midst of trying to defeat, things in our life that we're trying to have the courage to do. And so I really pray that today God can speak uh, to us. And so I have five steps when it comes to courage today that I believe that maybe will help us. And number one, the first step to courage is the pasture. And the pasture is important, right? The pasture is a place of preparation, that's really what the pastor is. It's a place of preparation. And I think all of us, when you look through our lives, right, sometimes we feel like we're in the midst of something that's so boring and so mundane that God is preparing us for something way bigger than we could even imagine when we're actually in the pasture. So the question that I have for all of us is what is what you're going through right now preparing you for? What is it that you're walking through? What is the struggle? What is the pain? What is the trial that you're walking through right now? And what could it be preparing you for? Now, if you remember David, right, he's in the pasture, he's watching the sheep. I don't know if he really ever thought of what that was preparing him for, what the pasture was actually preparing him for in the future. And if you read through the story, David did a lot of incredible things in the pasture that seemed to be a surprise to everybody. Like if you read this, and we're going to read this, it's 1 Samuel 17, verse 34 to 37. This is what it said, and this is when David is talking to Saul. It says this, but David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Now imagine starting with that. Like, hey, I can defeat this giant. Why? Because I've taken care of the sheep and goats. He's like, I know that, and that's not really helpful. Like, it's got to give me more than just sheep and goats. And then he says this. This is incredible. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. And 
this was a surprise to them, it seems like. Like, if, if I was in the pasture and a lion came and I, and I grabbed it by the jaw, I would be telling everybody about this moment. Like, do you know what I just did? I just killed a bear. I just killed a lion, but everyone's like, what? A lion and a bear? How, right? I would have told the whole world. It would have been on the news. I would have created, I would have invented the printing press just to share my story, okay? Like, this is powerful. Like, I've killed a lion and, and, and I catch it by the job and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, not just a lion or a bear, lions and bears. If I see a bear, I run faster than you so I can escape. That's my, that's my mission. As long as I'm faster than you, I'm, I can be safe. But he's like, no, I'm going to pursue the enemy. I'm going to pursue the lion. I'm going to pursue the bear. And if they try and hurt my sheep, I'm going to kill it. And then I might even eat it for supper, right? Like, I don't know what grilled bear tastes like. Probably never will. This is the moment that he starts sharing this story. He says, I've done this to both lions and bears. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. I find that so funny, but he said, and may the Lord be with you. I think he's like, basically like, this shepherd's about to die. All right, go ahead. We're going to lose the battle anyway. We've been here for 40 days, 40 nights. Nothing's happened. Let's send the shepherd. All right, go ahead. I'm like, and may the Lord be with you, right? How many times do we say that to somebody who's doing something that's like really big? It's like, the Lord be with you, which is amazing to say. I'm not saying that, but it's like, we're like, you're going to fail. <laughs> you know? I think he probably thought that, like, sure, you killed lions and bears, but have you seen this guy? He's nine feet tall. He's gnarling at us. He's scary. Like, all my soldiers, even me, I'm the king, and I'm scared of this guy. Who are you, this little shepherd? But anyway, he says, go and do it. Incredible that a leader made that decision. Good for him, right? But you, you think about it. This moment is so powerful, right? Because the pasture is what prepared David for the battle, right? The pasture, the moment where David was actually doing something that, you know, really at the time was not like the most prestigious job to have, but he's the youngest brother and he's out here. He's just, you know, taking care of the sheep, taking care of the goats, doing what he's supposed to do day by day, killing lions, killing bears, no big deal, no one cares. But in, the thing is, the pasture that you're in, what is right now preparing you for? And I think sometimes the pasture seems so mundane and so boring and just so like, I don't even want to do this anymore. That God is preparing you sometimes in the most boring moments for something so powerful later. We have to realize that the pasture really is the start where, where courage starts in the pasture. The thing is, like, if you're going to go into the battle without preparation, you, you might not make it. The courage might not be there because you've never seen anything like this before. So sometimes the, the, the trials or the things that are going to come, you need to go through something today. What are you learning through the trials? What are you growing in that's preparing you for what's next for you? The pasture is so, so, so important. How you prepare really matters. And I remember when I was in high school and I'd be preparing for my final exams and diplomas and how, I, my, how my preparation worked. Well, let me share how my friend's preparation worked first. My friend's preparation was hours and hours of studying every single night, going to bed late, waking up early, studying, going after class to talk to the teachers to get more help, doing f like fake exams, like putting yourself through more of it. My preparation was playing video games the night before the test. And <laughs> may the Lord be with me, right? Like, that's like, I <laughs> prayer. <laughs> You know, and then it's so funny because I would do this. I'd pray before the test. God, help me remember everything I learned. He's like, you didn't even study, man. Like, I'm not even sure that info's in your brain. Like, I'm going to have to, like, impart it to you. That's how I would prepare for my final. And then after the test, we'd get out and we'd be, talk, you know, always talking, like, what'd you get on this question? They'd be like, I got 56.4. And I'm like, I got Obama. I think I got it wrong. Like, how did I get that answer, right? You ever have a test like that? You're like, they're like, yeah, it's actually this. You're like, yeah, I didn't even get close to that. That's where I find myself. Why? Because my preparation for the test was horrible. Because do you know what's boring? Studying for a test. It's horrible. Let alone writing the test. That sucks. But preparing to write it? And then people who do the, the, the mock exams, I'm like, Why? But then I'm like, oh, I got 95% of my tests. I wish it was higher. I'm like, I passed. Woohoo, you know? 
high five, mom. You know, like, we did it. He's like, barely, you know, we barely made it. But how we prepare really matters. And I think we have to realize that, yes, preparation might seem boring. Yes, preparation might seem so like, like it's like, I want more. It's like, where's the battle? Where, where's the excitement? Where's the epic moments that I read about? And God's like, wait. And some of us were so frustrated in the pastor that what we end up doing is we end up wasting the time of preparation. So then what happens is when the trial comes, we're trembling with fear. That way when the giant comes in front of us, we're face to face. Fear is all we feel because we're not actually ready. We're not actually close enough to the Father. We're not actually close enough to God to actually know the courage and know who he is. And this is what David learned in this moment. He learned how powerful God was when he was in the pasture. We have to understand how powerful and how amazing God is. And you might not feel like anything valuable is happening. You might be like, man, I just, like, what's next? Like, what's the morning? You're like, like, there's got to be something. You're like what's, like, what's even happening? Why am I going through this? It might seem boring, but it might seem like everyone else is doing something more cooler than you. Like, his brothers are out at battle, and he's, at the sh- he's watching the sheep. His brothers are supposed to be fighting this battle, and he's just sitting back as his brothers go. And sometimes we feel like so- everyone else is doing the things we want to do. They're living our dreams. They're living our vision. They're living this moment. We're sitting here like, God, what about me? And I think he's just telling us, don't waste the season. Don't waste what you're going to learn in the pasture because what you learn in the pasture prepares you for everything else in your life. The pasture is really what got David ready for the entirety of his life. Don't waste the pasture that God has you in. You know, and a pasture is a place where you can, you know, be comforted and is a place that you can be safe and it's a place where even our father, like Jesus, right? Jesus, our shepherd, he comes and, he, and he, he's our shepherd and he takes care of us and we prepare in the pasture for the things that are going to come. You know, this week I, was, I just was asking some people on social media and just like in person, like, what do you need courage in right now? I was just wondering, like, what do people need courage in right now? And to be honest, the main answer was like to just get through what I'm doing right now. Right? Like, it's just like, I just need to be able to go one more day. I just need to have the courage and the strength to actually keep doing what I'm already doing. It's like sometimes we just need courage sometimes to just get out of bed. Sometimes we just need courage to go to our job that we hate and we're underpaid and we're like, God, like why? And he's like, just wait. Stay faithful. You know, sometimes we just need courage to be a good parent. Sometimes we just need courage to be a good spouse. Sometimes we need, need courage to just be a good human. You know, sometimes the courage we need is not to like, start a massive organization it's like to love our kids when they're screaming in the middle of the night right sometimes we just need courage sometimes we're like god i just need courage to survive to keep on going i want to encourage you just just have courage and stay faithful and stay patient and your time will come have his courage to not give up to trust him to give you something new and then number two the second step is this the call I think God has called each and every single one of us for a specific purpose. We see this in the story of David, right? David gets called. And this is what it says in 1 Samuel 16. And then Samuel asks, asked, are these all the sons you have? This is when Samuel's looking for the next king, right? He says, go to Jesse and find the next king. He's like, okay. So he starts going down the line of all the brothers. Is this all the brothers, all the sons you have? Like something's missing. These guys are not quite right. And he goes, there's the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Like, he's not your guy. Like, we gave him the sheep, and you want to give him the kingdom. Yeah, right. Right? Send it for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. This is urgent. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. I love how they just describe that. Like, good for him, right? It's like, where's my beautiful eyes? You know, maybe that's your question today. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So David stood him there among his brothers. Imagine this, and the youngest brother in front of all of his brothers. Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. You know, power comes when we receive our, when we realize our call. Right, it says this, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully, powerfully upon David. Power comes and we realize we're called by God to do something extraordinary. 
I think there's something that all of us are called to do. That's extraordinary. And you know what's extraordinary nowadays? It's having a family where the father is still present. You know, I was researching this week, the average, this is today, I was researching today, the average marriage in the United States lasts seven to eight years. You know, we're, we're living in such a broken society, broken culture, where we just need, sometimes the extraordinary is being a good father. Sometimes the extraordinary is actually just going to work and making sure that you can feed your family. Sometimes that's the extraordinary. Sometimes it's not, you know, becoming like a fighter pilot in the army. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like it's, sometimes it's like something that seems so insignificant, but you don't know the parenting. If you parent your kid right, what your child is going to do might be even more powerful and shorter than you could ever do. And what it took is you actually being present and loving and being there and not letting work take over and the stress of life take over. Just being there for your kids might be the most extraordinary thing that you can do. Power comes when we realize our, ca- our call. And the interesting thing about courage is that courage isn't the absence of fear. It's strength in the midst of fear. You know, there's a lot of things that terrify us. And it might be something small like me, like I talk about all the time, bumblebees. Like, I'm scared of them. It's like, people are like, why? I'm like, I don't really know, right? Like, I don't, I don't even understand it, but I'm like, so scared of them. But it might also just be like something of like talking to your boss about getting a promotion. That absolutely terrifies you. There's a lot of things in our life that scare us, and what courage is, it's actually giving us the strength to face our fear head on rather than trying to go around it. We all need courage to do things in our life, and I believe we are all called. And First Tim, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 9 says this, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. Sometimes that's the most extraordinary thing we can do, is to live a life dedicated to Jesus and serving his children. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. This call that we have is not something that we deserve, but something we get through Jesus. The call to do something, to be loving and to be patient and to be kind, and it's all through his grace. I want to encourage you, don't ever feel like God, that you've gone too far, that God can't still use you. That you can like, I know you might feel, no, like, do you know my story? If you read through David's life, you should see some of the things that man did. God can still use you no matter what. Do not feel like you're too far gone because he will use you. You might look at yourself and think, no, like, like not even anyone on this world can, can love me. How could, how could God love me? I want to tell you God loves you so much. You might think, but I've been so hurt. It's like, I know, and God knows your story, he knows your pain, and he wants to meet you there because he cares about you. That's why he gave his life for you because he wanted to rescue rescue you from that. God can still use you. In Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. One thing you have to realize about your calling just real quick is it's not about you. You see these miracles we're talking about? You know, we've talked about Jacob and Moses and David so far. All of these were about other people. Moses was about rescuing a nation from slavery. David was about facing this giant and actually stopping the battle. Every single time that our purpose is, if, it's, if your purpose in your life is just about you, it's probably not the right purpose. The purpose in our life has to be about people. It has to be about everybody else. It's not just about you. God loves you, but he wants you to use you to do something extraordinary. I know it might be hard right now, but God I, always is in the business of taking your mess and making it your message. He takes the things that you go through and says, this is now your story. This is now your testimony. Share what I've done in your life. And that's going to bring healing to other people. Sometimes the most painful moments we go through is actually a space where we can actually step forward and share our story. And that can actually bring hope and love and joy to other people. We all have a story. We all have pain. We all have things we've gone through that are so hard. But let's share that. So that way we can find healing ourselves. But that way we can bring freedom to other people as well. And the third step is the messenger, right? Right? You know, how David ended up in this battle in the first place, I find is just really funny. Like, it, it's kind of remarkable. Like, he wasn't even supposed to be there. 
He was just the messenger. He was just the delivery boy, right? Bringing some food to the real warriors, the real heroes. And we see this in 1 Samuel 17, 17. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report of how they're doing, right? Go bring some food, find out how they're doing, tell me what's going on. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army in the valley of Ella, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts, as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army, right? This epic moment. And this is, I think, what David was like, I want to just see the battle. It's been 40 days. Like, let's see how many people my, my brothers have conquered, right? Like, I can imagine him preparing to see this epic moment. And this, it starts. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to see uh, what was happening. To greet his brothers. And he, he was talking to them. Goliath the Philistine champion of Gath came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. So again, David shows up. He's like, man, I'm going to see how many, bro- how many guys my brothers have got. I'm going to see this epic battle. He shows up. It's about to start. And then all of the army starts to run away because they're scared. And this has been happening day after day, week after week after week. And David shows up after 40 days, and he's like, what? <laughs> like, what? I thought this was a battle. I didn't realize this was us, time for us to just run away scared. Like, I thought this was a battle. No, they are just scared. He goes and to deliver these snacks and deliver this food to the warriors and bring back a report on this, how the battle is going. And again, I don't know what he fully expected. Maybe he didn't even know if all his brothers would be there, right? Maybe his brothers, some of them had perished in the battle. Like, I'm sure some of these thoughts were going through his mind. What's going on? He couldn't just text them, right? Like, he had to go and see for himself what was actually happening. Would, would his brothers still be alive? Who would be winning this battle? A lot of questions, I think, running through his mind. And I have an older brother, and I think some of us have an older brother. And if I, if I were to head into a moment like this with my brother, I'd be like, my brother is so strong. He, is, he, he can conquer by himself. He's so strong. I'd be just like talking about, so highly about him. And then I'd show up, and he's running away scared. He's like, I'm the youngest brother, and y'all are just running away? Why, like, why are you so scared of this big, ugly man, right? Like, why? You know, this task was so menial, right? Like, really, like, it wasn't like this big thing. It's not like he was just going to go, and he was like, he went there ready to just kill Goliath. He went just to bring some food and get a report and head back to his brothers. And I think sometimes what we're going through in life, again, seems so menial. The tasks that God has given us feel so small. We're like, God, like, I want more. Like, why is it that everyone else is doing the things that I want to do? Why is it that everyone else is doing these things and I'm still out here, the delivery boy, the messenger just bringing stuff, waiting and getting reports and going back? Like, like there's got to be more for me. I think some of us, we ask this question, God, what's the more for me? He's like, just be faithful with the small things I give you because oftentimes the small tasks I give you open up the doors to the battle. The small things that God has asked you to do, some of us, we feel, I'm too good to do that, so I'm not going to do that. So, you know, that's, give that job to somebody else. That, is, that job is beneath me. That job is too small for me. Give it to somebody else. Give it to somebody younger than me. Give it to somebody less educated than me. Give it to somebody else. And God's like, no, be faithful with the job I've already given you. Some of us, we're not willing to do the small things God has asked us to, asked us to do because we just want the more, the bigger, the better. And he's like, be faithful. He goes, why would I be faithful with you? Or why would I give you more if you're not being faithful with, with what I've already given you? Are you being faithful at home with your family? Are you being faithful already with the job you already have? Are you being faithful with your friends? Are you being faithful with your kids? He's like, just be faithful with what you already have. The task, again, I know it might seem so small. So might say, ah, but I don't want to show up on time to this job. It sucks. I'm underpaid and, 
What I do go so unnoticed. Like, why would I even want to show up on time? It's horrible. I want to encourage you, be faithful. You know, as you might say, I don't want to keep living paycheck to paycheck, not knowing if I'm going to have the money to pay my rent and buy my groceries. And you're like, I don't know if I can keep going. I want to encourage you, be faithful. I know it's hard. I know just sometimes the everyday life is what we need courage for. It's just like to get through, to, to, to make sure that we have enough food to feed our family. Like I know that sometimes the courage we're desperately crying out for is just to make it through one moment. You know, oftentimes the consistency of the small things brings the reward of the bigger things. Be consistent. Be faithful. You know, I, if David hadn't gone to be as the messenger that day, I think that Goliath and Israel would still be standing at that valley today, right? Day after day, just moment after moment, just waiting. Right? Like, they're like, no, we're not going to fight you. And they just keep doing this day after day. It's like, David's like, okay, like, we got to put an end to this or else this is going to go on forever. Sometimes the call of God brings tasks in our lives that seem like they are below us or beneath us. But in reality, they are the road to get us to the battle, to get us to the purpose, to bring us closer to being face to face with the things in our lives that we need to conquer. It might be windy, it might be the road, but sometimes that's what God is using again, to get us to where we need to go. And number four is the warrior. The question is, do you know who you are? If you read the story, again, the king, the warriors, the soldiers, they did not know who they were and they did not know who they served. They saw the giant and thought, none of us are capable to defeat this giant. How do we know this? Because for 40 days, that's exactly the attitude that they had. Who's gonna fight him? Everyone's like, not me, the king. It's his job. He's like, no chance. I'm not going to fight. That guy's big. They didn't realize who they were. They didn't understand. They didn't understand the beauty of who God had called them to be. They didn't understand the fullness of it. And so what happened was they never actually stepped into the battle because they didn't actually know who they were. So what happens is this giant humiliates them day after day after day after day. Every day. Humiliation. Who's going to fight me? 40 days. I want, I want to tell you, this is exactly what our enemy wants to do to, in our lives too. Every day, he wants to humiliate you. He wants to belittle you. He wants to tell you you're not good enough. He wants to tell you you're weak. He wants to tell you you can't do it. He wants to tell you you're not strong enough. He wants to tell you these things. And some of us, we're believing the lies of the enemy about who we are. And so we're sitting back and letting someone else fight our battles. That's what the enemy does. He wants to belittle you. He wants to tear you down. He wants to tell you you can't do it. Why? Because he knows by yourself you probably can't, but with God anything is possible. So he does his best to make you think that you can't do it. Remember in the garden, Adam and Eve, right? This is what he says. He says, did he really say that? Did God really tell you that you, this is your call? Did God really say that? Did God really tell you that you're strong enough? Did God really... Did he really say that? Some of us, we believe the lies the enemy is trying to tell us. And this is exactly where the Israel army found themselves, right? We can't do it. I think after, I don't know how many days it would take for me to realize that nothing's going to change. Right? Like, like, how many days would they have just gone waiting? Like, who's going to do it? No one, right? It took someone brand new to the situation in order to fight. Sometimes even in our lives, the, the enemy is saying all these things about us. We need to bring somebody else in who's new to the story to start speaking life back into the room. To start speaking life back into our story. To start be, speaking life and saying, yeah, you know what? Let's do this together. Like we need people. And I talk about it a lot, but we desperately need people to be there for us to bring life back into the room when all we see around us is death. When our soul is so dark and so broken, we need people to help carry us and hold the weight and hold us up. The giants in front of you become small when God's in the room. And then 1 Samuel 17, 41, it says this, and this is where we see the humiliation. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering. <laughs> wow. I, it's just, he's an evil human being, I think, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. I am a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. 
Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. Now, if I'm walking down the streets and someone says this to me, I'm not pulling out my sling, okay? Because this is exactly what th- th- he had been saying to the Israel army. His tactic worked. I'm just going to tell you you're not good enough. I'm going to tell you that what you are isn't good enough. I'm going to use my gods to defy your God. The enemy will do whatever it, ta- it takes to trick you into thinking you can't do it. Even up until the final moment, he'll do whatever it takes. He'll hurl insults. He'll ridicule you. He'll destroy your self-esteem. He'll make you feel small and make you feel insignificant. Make you feel as if the weapon you're using is useless. How we respond to the ridicule is important. And this is how David responds. And this is so powerful because, again, this is the same thing. He'd been saying this to Israel. And then this little shepherd boy goes out and he says, why do you come to me with a stick? Am I a dog? And then David says this. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. That's a bold thing to say to a sneering, am I a dog, ugly human being. That's a bold thing to say. Because he's like, like, again, you got to remember, he just has a sling in his hand. This guy's got like his, like his, like he's, he's geared up for battle. Today, the Lord will conquer you. Just real quick, I want you to know something. Just real quick before we start this fight, the Lord will conquer you today. Just side note, needs you to know this. And I will kill you and cut off your head. <laughs> like, this story is absolutely insane if you really think about it. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. He takes everything that, that Goliath says and just like up one, Right? You're going to feed me to the birds and animals? Look behind you. See that army? It's their turn next, right? Like, it's incredible. Like, he's like, you know, you're gods? Check out my God of the armies. (laughs) And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. But not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Understanding this one thing will change everything, I think, for all of us. That the battle in front of you is the Lord's battle. I think if we can understand that the battle in front of us is the Lord's battle, it will change everything. Why? Because our confidence goes up, our courage goes up, our faith goes up, our hope goes up, our joy goes up, our love goes up. Why? Because we're fighting with Jesus. God is fighting with us. The battle belongs to the Lord. We have to understand that you have to realize that the all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God is fighting for us, and he's fighting with us. We don't have to let fear overtake us, and we can be filled with courage because he is fighting. He is going before us. He, we can stand tall knowing our Father is in the room. He will protect us. He's bigger than our giant. He is stronger. He is wiser He's a better warrior. If we see this later on in Numbers 13, you see they're they're trying to send some spies, trying to take the land, right, in Numbers. And this is what it says, Numbers 13, 33. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, And so we seem to them. What happened here is they saw themselves as small. And so what happened is they became small in the eyes of their enemy. Some of us, we feel so small and so insignificant. And our self-esteem is so low. We don't know who we are. That we've actually become so small ourselves. And so that's how the enemy will see you. It's small. But when we bring God back into the picture, when we bring him back into the room, and he stands beside us, we're under the shadow of his wings, that's when we can stand up and be like, my dad's got me. My father's going to take care of me. And that's what happens is he goes forward and he faces Goliath face to face and says, my father, my God is in the room. You have stand no chance in the presence of my God. Some of us, we let people walk all over us at work and we let people walk all over us at home. We always get extra tasks assigned to us because we struggle to say no. People love to take advantage of us and people love to manipulate us, to get their own way and we always seem to fall into the trap. 
You need to know that you belong to God. Once we give our life to him, we become his children and we receive his inheritance and his protection and we receive his name and our enemies become small when we realize whose shadow we're fighting from of the Father. And then the last step is this, the time. The time is coming when you'll be face to face with your biggest fear. Time is coming when you'll be face to face with your biggest insecurity. The time is coming when you'll be face to face with your enemy, when you'll be face to face with the challenge, when you'll be face to face with the giant, when you'll be face to face with the mountain. The time is coming. And everything that you have, that has prepared you for this moment is pushing you towards your enemy, face to face with the snarling giant ready to devour you. And in 1 Samuel 17, 48 to 51, this is the end of the story, this part of the story. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to cut him, uh, to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned away and ran. I think all of us, we need, we need courage right now. I don't know, you know, what all of us were facing. I, I don't know what you need courage in. You know, it might be to have a conversation with your children that you've needed to have for a long time. It might be to share the gospel, share Jesus with your neighbor. It might just be to get through the next day. It might be just to get through. It might be to ask that person out on a date that you've been waiting for. It might be to start serving at church or to stand up to the bullies at work or to overcome some of your deepest fears and deepest insecurities or to ask a client to finally pay you what they owe you, to have a hard conversation about boundaries with our spouse. What do you need courage in right now? That's the question I want us to all think about. What do you need courage in? But I want to tell you, everything you've gone through has prepared you for what you're about to face. All the trials, all the fear, all of it. You are ready. You, you can do it. We call on the God of David for courage. Our God, give me the courage to make it through. Give me the courage to overcome. Give me the courage to keep going. You might not face Goliath, right? But as we're saying about you, we might not face him, but we all have things we go through. We all have our own giants that are in front of us that we feel that we're incapable of conquering. I heard this story once, this true story of a pastor in his life that were, they were on a ship and all of a sudden a voice came on the intercom and said, we are going into a storm. You better buckle up. You don't want to hear that when you're on a boat, right? My mind automatically, Titanic, right? Like, iceberg ahead, you know, like, be careful. So the pastor's wife says, I don't really like this idea. So she, she calls the, cap, the captain, right? And the captain's assistant gets on the phone and she starts telling him her up plan. She's like, you know what we should do? Rather than go into the storm, let us just hold back. Let's put the anchor down and let's just wait it out. Let's let that storm pass, and then let's keep going. And so the assistant the captain says, I'll tell the captain, but good luck, right? Like, I'll talk to him. So the assistant comes back on, on the phone and says, the captain has two things to tell you. So number one is, I'm in charge and you're not. Like, that's the first thing. Like, you're not the captain of the ship. Like, I am. And this is number two, and I think this is so powerful. It says, this ship was built with this storm in mind. Right? This ship was built to overcome this storm. This ship was created with this storm in mind, saying, yeah, this storm might seem big, but this ship is ready and prepared for it. 
I think in life, it's the same way for all of us that what we've gone through has prepared us for this moment. The time is gonna come where we have to stand up and actually walk in courage to share Jesus, to be the people God has created us to be. You were created and born for a a time such as this where everything we've gone through has prepared us for this moment. When Jesus went to the cross and he died on the cross and he went to the grave and then he came again, was preparing us, getting us ready for salvation through Jesus as well as giving us the courage to overcome any obstacle, any fear that tries to stand in our way of living our life fully dedicated to following Jesus. The ship was built with this storm in mind. No giant, no storm is big enough or powerful enough to overtake our God, not one. We have courage like David when we approach the storm realizing we've already have the victory. We can approach the giant, we can approach the problem and know that we aren't fighting alone because the battle belongs to the Lord. And what's so interesting about my name, my name is Dustin. And my name means brave warrior or valiant warrior. I can't tell you how many times I didn't feel brave. Right? Like how many times I've been in life being like, I know my name means valiant warrior, but I'm not feeling that way today. I'm not feeling it. Sometimes I just feel like a helpless victim in the storms of life. And I need courage daily, courage to keep on going, to overcome, to stay strong, to know who I am. And sometimes I just need courage to even just get out of bed. But I want you to know you are a warrior through Jesus. You can fight these battles with him. You have the strength. You can do it. Your battle can be won with God. He loves you. His love comes with our storm in mind. I want to end our service today by reading Psalm 22. And this is a psalm that that David wrote. And I think, really, I think for a lot of us, this might be how you feel. This is how it starts in Psalm 22. It says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. If you, our ancestors, put their trust, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. If in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb and you made me trust in you even at my my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls around me. The strong bulls encircle me. Roaring lions that tear prey open with their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. He has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and the families of the nations will bow before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. 
All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to all the unborn, he has done it. So much in that. But you'll see so much reflection of this when Jesus is on the cross. Right? Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Same prayer that David prays here. He even says in this, he says, they, they, they cast lots for my clothing and they pierce my, arm, my hands and my feet. And I just want to encourage you. You know, as David wrote this, there's so, like, there's so much in this. I don't have time today, but I know that sometimes we feel like God isn't listening. I know sometimes we feel like God isn't answering our prayers. We, see, we're, we feel like we're crying out and we're not hearing anything. I want to encourage you, God will give you the strength. God will give you courage to keep on fighting, to keep on going. That the same God who did this for David, I believe he'll do it for you. To give you courage to overcome, to give you courage to go face to face with what's in front of you, with the courage to know that you can fight because God is fighting alongside you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for us today when it comes to courage because I think, again, I think we all need it. We all need to be courageous. We all have things we face that are really hard. We all have things that are in front of us that we don't know if we can keep going in. But I wanna encourage you that courage can come. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the one who brings courage into our broken souls. You're the one who brings courage when we don't know if we can keep on fighting. You're the one who brings courage when we feel so lost and feel like we're so tired and we feel like we just, it's, we're done. God, today we call on you and we say, God, give us the courage we need to keep on going. Give us the courage we need to be good parents. Give us the courage we need to face our addiction. Give us, give us the courage we need to have the conversations that we need to have. Give us the courage we need. Give us the strength we need to keep on going. And also, God, bring somebody like David into our life to encourage us and fight alongside of us. The people who can bring a new eyesight, a new vision into our mundane, sometimes broken situation. God, we call on you today and say, God, we need your courage now. In Jesus' name.